COVID-19 is shining a powerful light on the inequalities that exist in the United States today. You have probably read, seen, and heard the many, many stories about how this horrific disease and death is disproportionately affecting people of color, working and middle-class workers, the frail and the elderly. This is an epic moment for change. It is the perfect time to focus on those economic solutions that are transforming our economy in a way that it works for the many, not just the few, including our planet, ourself. <laughs> itself, but it is ours. You will meet in this series innovators that are engaged in systemic change that, it, that ranges from those who are addressing the foundation on which this economy is built, the enslavement of people and the theft of Native American lands, to the powerful creative ways that it is providing an economy that is based on equality, justice, and sustainability. Please join me in meeting all these incredible people that are not only informative, but inspiring in the way that they are making our future a better one for all of us beginning today. Today I'm interviewing Dr. William Darity Jr., who is a researcher and an economist. He is also a professor at Duke University University in Public Policy and co-author with Kirsten Mullen of this book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. I, I just wanted to know if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about your own personal connection to slavery in your own history. My connection that, that I have the greatest details information about is on my mother's side of the okay. family. Uh, and my mother's grandmother, my great grandmother, was the daughter of folks who had been enslaved on Rose Hill Plantation in North Carolina. Oh, wow. And uh, their, their last name was Body, B-O-D-D-I-E. So my great-grandmother was Tassie Body. She married a man named Jenkins, and so I always knew her as Tassie Body Jenkins. So uh, you knew her. Yeah. So, uh, so that, that's the, uh, the, the proximity to, to wow. enslavement is actually relatively close. In yes. My because my, my mother's mother, my grandmother, was actually only two generations removed from slavery. Uh, so, so I think that's, that's illustrative of the point that we were trying to make in the book is uh, that, that you know, people talk about slavery being such a long, long time ago. Yes. Uh, if you think about it from a generational perspective, it really isn't. I think there was also a dimension of us wanting to honor mm -hmm. the folks who had been subjected to that regime and came out of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, in your book, um, you, you, you both talk about um, the three tiers of, of uh, the slavery, the Jim Crow, American apartheid, and then the ongoing discrimination um, and injustices of African Americans. And I, I want to talk about that history, the, the whole of it, because I don't think a whole lot of us know that the length of it, I, you may even have mentioned in your book, it's not just about slavery, it's about everything that came afterwards yeah. uh, as well. Yeah. And I know at one point uh, I had read something where you wrote that uh, wealth is an enabling uh, factor that with wealth you have political access, you have education, you have good health care, you have a legacy to pass on to to future generations. So I want to talk um, start with slavery 
and um, where the wealth inequity started. Slave grown uh, cotton was to the played the role in the economic development of the United States that slave grown sugar played in the economic development of the United Kingdom. And you think about the rise of the United States as an economic power as being connected to uh, the cotton sector. Uh, and in fact, the cotton sector was critical to the development of, uh, of, of the textile industry writ large because right, there's right. a forward linkage to textile production. Um, but the cotton sector was also critical to the development of New York City. I mean, it was central to New York City's um, to New York City's rise to the point that the mayor of New York City, at the point at which secession was taking place, actually made overtures that the city of New York should secede and join the Confederacy. Oh my! So, so you know, cotton. Yes, cotton was vital to the story of American economic development, but more specifically, slave-grown cotton. I stayed on Wall Street, and I found the plaque in Wall Street where the auction block actually was for slavery. It's like Wall Street sprang from that yes. auction block. From that auction block, yeah, yeah. 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 When, when slavery was still legal in New York, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. But one of the central points we try to make in the book is, is how organic slave ownership and slave holding was to uh to southern life right uh, and and actually the actual figure is that at the national level uh slave the the proportion of families that own slaves is about eight percent uh but it was that low only because uh at the point of the civil war uh virtually all of the northern states uh, were not slaveholding states. There were border states that stayed with the Union that were slaveholding mm -hmm. states, but the, the northern states uh, writ large had no slave ownership, so there were no families that owned slaves there. But that, that contrasts very, very sharply with the southern situation. And could, could I read something from our sure, book? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, so here's a passage from, from our book where we talk about this. Um, I need to take my glasses off to read. Okay. In 1860, at the national level, approximately 8% of all American families owned at least one slave. But this seemingly low aggregate national percentage was influenced heavily by the 21 non-Southern states where no families owned slaves during the last days of the antebellum period. By 1860, the Southern experience with slaveholding stood in marked contrast with the Northern pattern. Among the 11 states that seceded from the Union in 1861 to establish the Confederacy, Arkansas, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, Texas, and Louisiana, registered at the lower end with at least 20% of white families owning slaves, uh, this range from 20% to 29% for that set of states. The remaining five states all registered proportions of 34% or higher, peaking at staggering rates of 46 and 49% in South Carolina and Mississippi, oh respectively. So in those states, you know, at least half of the families own slaves. Right. And then if you look at the the proportion of whites who lived in families that were slaveholders, then the figures get even larger. So the national figure was 13%. But in 1860, one quarter of whites in Arkansas and Tennessee lived in families that owned at least one slave. In Texas, Virginia, and North Carolina, at least one third of whites lived in slave owning families. And then the proportions rise well above 40% in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana, cresting as, and in our language we say, at a fantastic 55 and 57% in Mississippi and South Carolina, respectively. So we conclude that at the onset of the Civil War, Southern whites and slave ownership were intertwined tenaciously, 
And uh, the movement towards civil war was an act of widespread self-interest on the part of Southerners, not something that was prompted by some tiny minority of the population that owns slaves. Okay. Um, the other thing that the, the, the bigoted pundits always throw out is this line that there were black slaveholders in the United States. And, and that is true. There were some black people who did own slaves. But in, in, uh, in one of our footnotes in the book, we say the following. Slaves held by free blacks comprised a tiny proportion of the total number of enslaved persons. The best available estimates indicate that 3,000 free blacks owned 20,000 people in 1860, approximately 0.05% of the 4 million enslaved persons. The 3,000 slave-holding blacks themselves constituted less than 1% of the 477,000 free blacks in the United States. Wow. Yeah. So, um, you know, these are these are a couple of, of highly objectionable talking points that we thought it was essential that we address in the book. Yeah. The Civil War ends and then it continues. This is the first I have read of the black codes being um, the slave codes, based on the slave codes. Would you would like to talk more about that? Because I, I'd like people to know just how horrendous that was. Yeah. So in the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, you know, there was the possibility of, of two fairly extraordinary things happening that could have actually charted a completely different course for the United right. States. So one of these would have been the provision of the promised 40 acre land grants to the formerly enslaved. And the other was uh, full, uh, full, full suffrage. Right. That's what at, Lincoln at asked. Least, at least for black men. Okay. Yes. At least for black yes. Men. Um, but, uh, but neither of those things took place. And in large measure, the latter uh, the capacity to participate fully in the political process in the United States was destroyed by a systematic white terror campaign, which we view as the rejuvenation of the act activities of the uh, uh, of the rebellion that had taken place on the part of the secessionist states. Mm -hmm. That this persisted, and to the extent that they maintained any degree of control over state legislatures they proceeded to enact what we now refer to as the Black Codes. Uh, the Black Codes essentially restored the status of servility on the part of Blacks in the United States and actually constituted a form of what some people like to refer to as neo-slavery. Um, they, uh, they, they restored conditions where uh, blacks were fully subject to the whims, preferences, and desires of whites, uh, where blacks had no more control over, uh, over the lives of their children, right. uh, where working activities and employment were structured and strictly under the control of, of whites. So what type of work you did, under what conditions, all of these things were uh, were detailed in the black codes in such a way that blacks had no autonomy over uh, over their over their lives. So um, yeah, so so you you could you could argue very clearly that the Civil War continued, and it continued, but it continued uh, in the guise of guerrilla warfare, lynchings, other types of white terrorist acts as well as the attempt to restore legal conditions that would be very similar to the circumstances that people lived in under slavery. Mm -hmm. I remember being uh, aghast at the fact that uh, under the Black Codes, it, the worker, the, the, the Black worker had absolutely no power. They couldn't quit if, if right. the conditions were inhumane. And the whites could deem themselves white citizen arrest or whatever and bring yes. those back to the sheriffs and the deputies. Yes. 
And then the the money, the bounty that was collected on that would pay the deputy salaries. I remember yes, I was yeah. like So you have all these perverse incentives that are operating in the system. Yeah. Yeah. And to separate a two year old child from their family and send them or or put them in well, line training. You know, this, 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 th 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 it's 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 important that you said that, uh, because I think that uh, that we all have had tremendous empathy for the horrifying scenes of family separation that took place at the border. Right. But there's such a long history of that in the United States. And it's, it's clearly linked to the way in which uh, race and racism have operated in this country. I know. I remember uh, it, it, at the peak of the separation of those children uh, at our border, uh, from families. I, I was visiting um, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery that Brian Stevenson, and he had they have holograms there where you can, and it's almost like an alcove, and you step into the alcove in this hologram of the slave woman on a block saying to me, have you seen my children? I am just my God. Brought yeah, it those home. holograms are are powerful, moving, yes. and deeply yes. disturbing. So the black codes, the white terror. Do you want to say anything more about either one of those before we go into the Jim Crow laws and? Well, the, the white terror campaigns actually uh, begin in the aftermath of the Civil War, and they they actually carry through in in a series of massacres that take place and. Uh, in cities both north and south, towns both north and south, up until maybe the end of the at the end of World War II. I mean, they take place for a long, long time. They're quite sustained. They involve massive loss of black lives uh, and either massive destruction of black property or appropriation of black property. Uh, by by white terrorists. Uh, so I think the most dramatic example that people may be familiar with is the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre of 1921. Uh, at least as 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 destructive and significant was the Wilmington massacre of 1898. Uh, but in the year 1919. Uh, there was a series of these massacres that took place, leading people to refer to it as the bloody summer of 1919. Yeah. Uh, it included a horrific, uh, horrific set of uh, set of, of murders that took place in Chicago, Illinois, for right. example. But there were there was a number of these. Uh, maybe uh, two of the bloodiest states might have been Florida and Louisiana. Yeah, yeah I read that. Yeah. Um, and, and of uh, course, we had Rose, Rose, Rosewood, Rosewood right yeah, the street yeah. here, 1923. And, and I think Rosewood is the only massacre in the state of Florida where some attempt was made at compensation. Mm -hmm. But but Florida has a notorious record, and uh, I mean, one of the other very significant ones is in Ocoee, Florida, or took place right. in Ocoee, yes. Florida, which were intended in large measure to intimidate blacks and to keep them out of the voting process. Is it also accurate to say then, too, that many times the white violence in, in the black communities was linked to a black man whistling at a, a, a sexualizing a, a white woman in some way or being blamed? Well, Doing well, at that. least at least that that was the alleged. Reason. Yeah, that's what I meant. Being that's blamed for that—that that was the. I mean, because if we, if we think about the Rosewood case, the Rosewood case, uh, the uh, you know, apparently the there was a, a white man who was cuckolded, but he was cuckolded by another white man, <laughs> and somehow the 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 incident became one in which uh, the black community was somehow held responsible for this. Yeah. 
and yeah. and and uh, and and it led to this this horrific horrific massacre. So so, so many times uh, there is an allegation, or there was an allegation, of some sort of uh, act uh, that that transgressed these mm-hmm. boundaries on the part particularly on the part of black men towards white women. Uh, But if you think about the Wilmington case, uh, one of the precipitants for that massacre, one of the direct precipitants, was an editorial that was placed in the black newspaper. Uh, And this editorial was a challenge to the uh, remarks that had been made uh, by a, a, a white female pundit who had said that, that lynching was entirely justified because it was a means of containing the raping behaviors of black men. And the editorial that ran in the black newspaper in Wilmington said, well, now, you know, in many instances, uh, these uh, white women are actually attracted to these black men and they're the ones who initiate these relationships. The way in which America's racial sexual history has been crafted is actually very important in the context of the way in which these massacres have unfolded. Tell us more about the Jim Crow laws. I know that they came into effect in 1877 uh, and extended up through the 1950s. Can you elaborate on that? Jim Crow laws are, are essentially uh, essentially establish a regime of legal apartheid in the United States. Uh, and uh, apartheid means separate. Uh, and so they establish conditions where there are legal boundaries set between the spaces, the jobs, the schools, that blacks and whites could uh, could occupy, and they were designed in such a way to uh, to demarcate the black spaces as being necessarily inferior. Racial wealth disparity is a primary index of the cumulative economic effects of all of the racial injustices that have taken place in the United States. And, and that gap is, is, is enormous. Uh, so you, collectively, black Americans who are descendants of folks enslaved in the United States constitute about 13% of the nation's population, but have about 2.6% of the nation's wealth, uh, a gap or mm-hmm. a shortfall of $800,000 per household between black and white households. And we argue in, in our book, From Here to Equality, that the starting point has to be the failure to provide the formerly enslaved with the land grants that they were promised in the aftermath of the Civil War. So that's, that's the, the, the first point. Then to the extent that blacks were able to accumulate property and develop businesses, in many, many cases, those were destroyed by the massacres that I was talking about, and their property was actually seized by folks who engaged in the massacres. Uh, but if you turn to the 20th century, where we have placed a significant amount of emphasis on home ownership mm-hmm. as a source of wealth, uh, and I, I would perhaps argue that we've placed an overemphasis on it because the folks in the upper 25% of the wealth distribution do not rely very heavily upon home ownership as their as their source of uh, their source of wealth. Uh, but uh, for folks in the middle of the wealth distribution, home ownership is the, the a home is the most significant asset that they have in their possession. And in the 20th century, there is a set of policies and practices that disproportionately deprive blacks of, of access to either outright ownership of a home or to ownership of a home with comparable value or equity as homes that were owned by whites. 
And we can start with the existence of restrictive covenants that produced uh, segregated communities. Now, restrictive covenants are deeds that indicate that particular groups are not uh, are not going to be eligible to purchase homes in, in those neighborhoods. Uh, when restrictive covenants are are eliminated, uh, then there's a turn to an emphasis on what you referred to as redlining, uh, which is again uh, a mechanism for segregating neighborhoods and uh, depreciating the relative value of black owned homes. Uh, so this is a case where there's kind of credit starvation that's taking place for potential black homeowners uh, as a consequence of the way in which specific neighborhoods are denied access to home mortgages or denied access to home mortgages on comparable terms right. as, uh, as potential white home buyers. Um, and, and that, uh, that redlining context created a phenomenon of predatory lending, uh, which made it increasingly difficult for blacks to become homeowners but also if they did manage to become homeowners, they would be homeowners in neighborhoods where the, uh, the properties were less likely to appreciate to the same degree that they were appreciating in, in predominantly white neighborhoods, regardless of the structural characteristics of the home. Then that's compounded by the GI Bill, where uh, the GI Bill is introduced for the purposes of creating upward mobility for veterans of World War II, uh, perhaps the most significant piece of legislation to promote upward mobility in the history of the United States. Uh, it facilitated college attendance, and it also facilitated home purchases. Uh, but it was uh, adopted uh, with some provisions at the behest of some of the Southern legislators that guaranteed that the, uh, the program would be administered in a decentralized fashion. So there was a tremendous amount of discretion over the administration of the program at the state and local level. There was a pattern of systematic exclusion of black veterans from the benefits. Uh, so much so that I think in Ira Katz Nelson's book, When Affirmative Action Was White, he points out that in the state of Mississippi, there were only two black veterans who got the benefits of, uh, of the GI Bill. You stacked up the process of uh, supporting upward mobility in favor of, of whites and against blacks by the use of the GI Bill in the early part of the 21st century, where we have the Great Recession and now the pandemic, where the federal response to both crises is, one's, is, is a response that merely can make the, uh, the, the, the racial wealth gulf even, even wider. Uh, because of the way in which funds have been distributed. So in the Great Recession, uh, the support is given largely to the investment banking community. And in the current crisis, at least the first uh, allocation of funds under the CARES Act went disproportionately to direct uh, payments to uh, larger corporations and businesses as well as larger banks. Um, and, uh, and as a consequence, we can only imagine that the racial wealth divide is just going to get larger. Right.